Okay, so uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, this is my first time in Singapore, so I've been doing all the tourist things, and we'll be doing more of them in the coming days, and it's, it's beautiful here so far, so that's, that's amazing. Despite the thunderstorms, I actually like that. I live in LA, so it never rains. So even rain is kind of interesting to me. Um, so today, I want to talk about ta taming the modern data center, and, and the subtext here is more important, which is automating into the future. So um, I already got an introduction, um, but uh, I'll be around here all day, so please grab me if you want to talk about anything. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable just randomly talking to me, walking up to me, uh, feel free to tweet at me, uh, and I'll try to respond to that too. Uh, I'm the founder of a company called HashiCorp. Uh, we've created uh, all these tools around here. Um, this is the last sort of I'm going to be talking about the tools is just a si this slide, and I'm only going to say their name. Uh, the only little like pitch I'll give is that Seth uh, is here from HashiCorp 2, and he's giving a workshop tomorrow on Terraform and Consul. So if you want to learn about those, hopefully you're signed up. Um, but also, if you want to ask me any specifics about any of these, again, just, just grab me or, or Seth, and I'm happy to talk to you about them. So uh, just to give you the names in case that helps you recognize some of these, uh, Vagrant, Packer, Surf, Consul, Terraform, Vault, Nomad, and Atlas is our enterprise products. Um, are all the things that I can't, I can't take credit for singularly creating, but I was at least part of the teams that created all these. Um, but with that, I kind of just want to dive into the talk. And so, you know, even looking at this, you can see that there's a lot of tools, and we build a lot, but there's, you know, a lot more out there. And I think it's really important to understand that sometimes when you look at all this, it could just feel like people are doing things because they're cool, or they're just uh, building because they can. And uh, there's actually really sound reasoning behind it and really uh, big problems that are being solved. And it's really straightforward relatively as long as you put it the right way, and I'm going to attempt to do that. Um, so to get going there, um, I'm going to start first talk about how we got here today, sort of really basic you know, DC evolution to where we are today. And this is going to, I mean, I think everyone here will be really comfortable with what I'm about to say, so I'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, so obviously, when we got started, it was just really one machine. And when you have one machine, it's relatively easy to manage that thing just manually. You could just do everything manually. You could set, you know, plug it in manually. You could SSH into it manually or just even attach a keyboard to it. Um, it's pretty easy to get that going. Let me move the mouse. Um, nope, let's not move it over there. Um, pretty quickly after uh, the first machine, you know, to scale up, uh, you, there's, you start getting multiple machines. And Multiple machines, as long as you have a few of them, it's still relatively easy to do things manually. Um, but at this point, we're starting to introduce some complexity and difficulty in, in management. So starting to get a little bit more. Um, in the past 15-ish you know, years, uh, the rise of virtualization happened. Um, so thank you, VMware. Uh, we're, we can now split up physical servers into uh, a bunch of little slices of virtual machines. So. Uh, this starts increasing the complexity a lot. Uh, this, this did a lot for increasing the complexity. It also did a lot for us to be able to better utilize machine resources. Introduction of things like VPSs became a lot easier, things like that. Um, but in this case, we're starting to have networking problems. So it's not just multiple machines. It's how does the VM on one machine talk to a VM on another. Um, it's, you're starting to come up with problems of how do applications find each other easily if it's in one VM or another, like what's their address. You can't really hard code IPs anymore. It gets a little bit difficult. Um, but as you can see, the trend is just rising complexity. And this is 15 years ago, right? So it was already getting pretty complicated then. Um, and then in the past few years, we've gotten containers. Um, so now we slice up the VMs even further and put containers in there. Um, and of course, you can run containers just on physical machines. But the general way they run today, the most popular way they run today, is on VMs, uh, mostly because of clouds, right? Uh, but this is starting to be what our data centers are looking like. It's you have a bunch of servers that you generally don't worry about if you're using a, a cloud, but then you have the VMs, which you're certainly worrying about, and then on top of there, you have the containers and the applications, uh, and then the more the same complexity all the VMs introduced are now at the container level too. And then it goes even farther um, and. There's services. So a lot of us today don't even run all our core, what would have been considered core data center services inside our data center anymore. Um, things like DNS, things like CDNs, uh, things like databases even for a lot of companies are just service providers. So it's now sign up, for, you know, sign up for a service, get the address. You don't see whether it's a container or VM or what that is. 
um, but you get access to a fully functioning uh, thing where the promise is you don't, wor it's not really your concern about the uptime there uh, anymore is, is sort of where a lot of things are moving to. And this is obviously very, very popular. Uh, even things like AWS RDS and things like that are, are all in this category. And so uh, this is more or less where we are today. Um, and it's pretty complicated. And then now there's also multi data center. So all this stuff, if you consider this one data center, uh, you could package it up and there is multiple of them. And this is still something that's relatively, uh, uh, you know, bigger businesses are doing. But compared to 10 years ago, a lot smaller businesses are starting to go multi data center really, really quickly because it's really easy to click a few buttons and get a machine in another region. It used to be a ton of work to be able to uh, build out infrastructure resources from you know, Virginia to somewhere like Sydney or Frankfurt. But now you could do it in a few minutes. And because of that, a lot earlier scale businesses are starting to go multi-data center and starting to understand that there's a lot of challenges with that, both in writing the applications, but also just managing data, managing uh, all sorts of things. And so this is just being pushed down to a lot more people. When it, this used to affect you know, 10,000 people in the world or 10,000 companies. This is now affecting millions. Uh, so that's, that's a challenge. And, and this is pretty much what, what that looks like today. And then there's all the as a services. So there's infrastructure as a services, which are the Azures, the Google Clouds, the Amazons of the world. Um, there's platform as a service, which is Heroku. Um, uh, things like Pivotal would fit in here, or Cloud Foundry. Um, also even things like Kubernetes would probably fit in here, although that's a little bit uh, uh, murky. And then there's software as a service, which is like things like database as a service and so on. So you have all the as a services, which you're, every company is generally using at least one thing in each of these categories. And the reason that's part of your data center is because in general, if you, for a deployed application, if you don't have one of these, then, and, you're, and you're used to running it, if one of them disappears, then your application no longer runs. And so you have to consider it a part of your data center. Like if you're, even if you're using, um, uh, you know, a database as a service, if that database as a service disappears, your app doesn't run and now you have to worry about spinning up your own database or something. So these have to be considered a core part of what is in your data center, where in your data center went from a physical boundary that you could like visually see to a more abstract, you know, dotted line around a bunch of things needed to run your application. Uh, and then there's still multiple operating systems. So this is still something that's pretty much relegated to the much bigger or much older companies. Um, the smaller businesses or startups are generally pretty good about homogenizing on one operating system. Um, but still, definitely at the larger companies, you're seeing all three, um, at least Windows and Linux, uh, inside the data center. And so you still have to worry about managing multiple of those. Um, and at the very least, for smaller companies, you often see multiple versions of an operating system. Um, and so all of this complexity, all of this like heterogeneity is the way, the word that we use at HashiCorp to describe all this all the time is just, all this heterogeneity isn't because, uh, is legacy, but l legacy doesn't mean cruft, it doesn't mean incompetence, it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It's usually just a uh, an artifact of the fact that you were around since before some of these other things were best practices or you changed your mind about something. And that, that's not necessarily a mistake, it just also shows that you can't atomically switch from one technology to another. You know, when containers come out and you really want to adopt something like containers, you can't, if you're, if you're in a business that's been around long enough, which isn't that long, like even if you're a startup, it, you'll have this problem. You can't go from being all on VMs to all on containers in a single atomic switch. It takes time. So during that transition, you inevitably have a heterogeneous, fairly complex uh, environment. And, and I think that regardless, even if you're homogenous, it's still pretty complex to manage it all. So, so that's really how this stuff happens. Um, in some cases, sure, it's cruft and things like that. But I like to give most people and companies the benefit of the doubt that they have the best intentions in mind. It's just going to be complicated to get there. So given all this complexity, we need a way to tame it. We need a way to control it and understand it. And so uh, to do so previously, the way all this stuff would happen would be uh, this cycle of acquire, provision, update, destroy. And this is an abstract you know, cycle that you could apply to physical goods, you could apply to software, um, you could apply to software as a service, anything really. And so in the acquisition step and the acquire step, uh, we'll use physical machines as an example just because it's, it's really obvious. 
Um, but in the acquisition step, you're trying to like get the physical machine. And to do that, you would communicate with a vendor. You would find a vendor that had the type of machine you wanted. You would physically talk to them, uh, negotiate a contract, and, and order the thing. Once it arrived, uh, the data center operations team would unbox it, plug it in, set that thing up, and maybe set up some initial OS, initial software on there, uh, and get it going. Still a very human operation. Uh, and then when there's an update, so you know, updating the OS to updating, deploying new applications, uh, et cetera, this would be more of a sysadmin type role that would go in there and update the machine. And then finally, in the decommission or destroy step, uh, the DC ops would come back in. And, and when they decide a machine is either out of lease or no longer needed, um, they would plan the migration of whatever software is on there to another machine, unplug the machine, and obviously send it back. Um, so the trend that you can see like on the bottom here, the, like the common thread uh, in this old cycle, which is probably you know, 10, uh, 15 years ago now, is it's very, very human oriented. There's a lot of communication happening, uh, and there's just a lot of people things happening. And so because of that, the time, sorry, this is so low, it's going to be hard to read, but the, the time uh, order of, of doing each of these steps is pretty high. So acquisition you know, could take weeks from the fact of ordering it to it being at your door. Uh, setting up the machine could take days, it could take hours, but there's a lot of manual steps involved there. Updating could also take days just to get the communication, the ticket to be picked up, and people will start doing work. And then the destruction also takes days, mostly because unplugging a machine is pretty easy, but uh, moving all the software and, and migrating the things that are on there is definitely not. So uh, there's a lot of things that happened here. And this really wasn't that long ago. And for some companies, a lot of this is still today. <laughs> um, but, then, but then things happened, um, and we got a couple really important uh, innovations, which is elastic compute and you know, something as a service. Uh, and so first starting with elastic compute, this took the two outer edges, the acquire and destroy step, uh, and then put an API in front of them, automated this whole thing. So get rid of talking, the, the traditional way of talking to a vendor. Now you're talking to a cloud provider. It's a little different. But they're not shipping you a box anymore, right? They're, they're shipping you an API, which is v digital or virtual, that you're hitting in order to acquire a machine and also destroy the machine. And so this enabled the weeks and days to go uh, to minutes and seconds. And so when you think about it this way, it's, it's pretty s clear to see uh, why Elastic Compute was such a revolutionary sort of concept. Um, and then once, once this, these outer things are so fast, the new bottleneck is obviously in the middle here. You have, you have provision and update taking days. So before, the fact that acquiring a server took weeks made it that provisioning the server taking days just wasn't a big deal. It's, it's, it's very low cost compared to how long it even took to get the machine. But now, when you're starting to acquire machines so quickly, uh, these two things become the bottleneck. Um, yeah, another important concept, I forgot this slide, but another co important concept is obviously this shift shifted sort of the budgetary stuff from capital expenses to operational expenses, which for uh, most businesses at a certain size is a really big deal, uh, a big cost saver, a big budgetary saver, and it, it, it changes the way things can be built. Um, and also gave rise to something, as a, anything, all the things as a service. So then going back, though, to this middle section, uh, you have these things taking days. And while configuration management as a thing has been around since the 90s or even like the late 80s, uh, the real popularity, when I, when I believe that configuration management really came to be a very popular concept, was around the same time you got Elastic Compute. It was around the same time AWS really became a thing is when uh, if you look at just GitHub stars or download numbers for those that are published, of things like Chef and Puppet, there's a huge uptick right in the same year that EC2 came out. Um, and it's really because once the outer edges are so fast, and that's the bottleneck, you need to figure out how to make this a lot faster. So provisioning and updating needed to go from a manual process to an automated process in order to get it fast. And so because of configuration management, uh, we're going from days for the update and provision step uh, down to minutes and seconds there as well. And of course, like, it's still easier to just not do anything at all, or the hope that you don't have to do anything at all. And so uh, more recently, uh, there's been just a huge proliferation in using SaaS for everything, um, especially for startups, um, DNS, email sending, um, I mean email receiving, uh, load balancers, CDNs. Um, I mean, every, uh, almost everything, right, is, is becoming something as a service. You could start a business for a really long time before you ever SSH into your first server. 
Um, and that's really, really cool. So this is happening. So this just gets rid of that completely in a way. It's, it's a totally different process. And this is relatively new due to the cheap availability and fast availability of this cycle for the other machines. Uh, but this still results you know, in, in this rising data center complexity um, that we're trying to control. And we've come, come at it and tried to control it a little bit. So Elastic Compute helps a lot. The, the cycle's a lot easier to control. And configuration management helped a ton as well in controlling how the machines are set up. But it's really complex still. And why, why is it so complex? Uh, the, the goal of any you know, data center is to effectively deliver and maintain applications. That's, that's our only purpose of being. Um, if, if you didn't want to do this, then none of that stuff would have to exist at all. Um, so all of us still just want to ship what we're building. If, if we're building a website to look at restaurant reviews, or we're building a website to call cars, or we're just anything, really. Like, all these servers only exist to make that possible. Um, and so all this complexity is how do we make that faster, safer, uh, and so on. So another way to put it is, you know, how do we move faster without breaking things? And that's what people are trying to push forward with. And so given all this, like, what's left? So what, you saw an interesting pattern of uh, the outside took, the acquire and destroy steps took so long, so people focused on that. And then when that was solved, the new bottleneck was in the middle, and then people focused on that and solved that problem. So then the question is really, like, what is the new bottleneck, or what are the new bottlenecks? Um, and, and there's a few I'm going to mention here. I think there's a lot of interesting ones, but I'm going to frame it in the, in, the, uh, in the sense of what new software are we existing today that's really popular. And so let's take a look back at this is what we ended with, um, and let's start with sort of this data center. So one of the things that uh, was a HashiCorp sort of core um, uh, thesis was that one of the new bottlenecks is this thing as an atomic unit. Um, so Spinning up one server, somebody could do that in minutes. Spinning up a set of VMs, again, minutes. There's a lot of APIs for that. Um, sending containers onto a machine is like a Docker runaway, so it's, that's pretty fast. But you need all these pieces together to actually run your application. You need the network, you need the storage, you need the database, you need all the SASs, you need all this stuff together. And so one of the things was like, if I approached you know, any one of you that manages an application and said, I need a whole new region, a whole new data center set up to run the application, and not multi-DC, not two talking to each other, each other, just think of it as a new environment, staging or something, a new staging environment. If I came to you and said, I, hold, I need a full staging set up to run, isolated from anything else to run your application, how long does that take you? Um, and it's, especially a couple of years ago, this was still a long time. Um, it was still hours, days, weeks. Um, there, it was still a lot of work to get going there. Um, and so I'll put weeks here, but maybe if some people with really good automation still had it at hours. But the building the entire data center as an atomic unit uh, is really slow. And, and that's just a really important thing, because applications, especially with the rise of things like microservices, there's more individual pieces to run the full application. So you need to be able to reason about uh, an environment as an atomic unit. So how do we speed that up? So that's one of the bottlenecks. Um, another bottleneck is, is a SaaS. So let's take a look at the SaaS stuff. So, this slide is a copy of what was before, which is that when you move to SaaS or cloud services, the acquire provision update destroy cycle disappears. Um, but that's not totally true. It, it, it disappears sort of in the physical infrastructure sense, but it doesn't disappear uh, as an abstract concept. So um, as an abstract concept, you still have to acquire an account or you know, a namespace of sorts. Like You need to create a, a cloud account to set these up. Uh, you need to provision the resources by to, if it's a database provider, you need to tell it you know, how much RAM you want, how much uh, disk space you want, IOPS, those sorts of things. And then they set it up for you um, automatically. When you change things, there's an update process still there. And then when you destroy them, you have to manually decommission it. So there's still a management cycle uh, to these cloud services. And at about the same time, uh, I, I, uh, we sort of recognize that this, this is still like an hours management approach. Because although these things all had APIs, uh, most people, the way they spin up, um, something as a service is to log into the control panel, click around, and get the instances they want. And relating it back to the data center as an atomic unit idea, if you need a database as a service, as an individual component to make your application run, you need to be controlling that through the API. You need to be doing that all automatically. Um, and so the same thing, the same thing that sort of Elastic Compute did for physical resources, you just needed an API in front of all SaaS. And 
And the big benefit is that almost every SaaS provider has an API. And, and in this day and age, if you don't have an API on your, on your as a service thing, uh, it more or less just doesn't exist because you need to be able to automate it. Uh, and then the, the last couple things is how to manage these little boxes that are on your thing. So I put app here instead of VM and A here instead of container because I'd rather talk about applications rather than what's, what's you know, sandboxing the application. So how do you deploy the application? We can now build all these servers super, super easily, but how do we get the applications on there? Is that really easy? Um, and, and in addition to just getting it on, handling failure is usually the more complex piece. So if, like, if this host VM dies and all these applications are on there, how are they migrated to another machine? Is it manual? Is it automatic? How is that decision made? Even if a single machine fails, it just has a single application, how is that brought back up? Um, uh, arguably the much easier case than a multi-app, like a multiplex sort of machine. But how does this happen? Um, and this is again one of those things where there's just a lot of people things happening when I looked at it. Um, it was when a failure happens, someone's paged, someone thinks about it, um, someone either runs Chef or something manually on another machine, runs their automation to bring up a new machine to, to move the application. There's still just a lot of human steps happening. Uh, and because of that, it was something that was still taking hours, sort of in the best case. Uh, and then the other thing is like, if you have an app and green for healthy here, and then it, it doesn't fit there anymore. Like say it uses more resources than it could, it's starving that machine, and it, it scaled beyond the point where it makes sense to be with all these other little uh, machines here, uh, little apps here, then how do you move it? Is that, is that the same process? I, I, it's a little bit different, it could be the same for you. Um, but that's still a very human thing. The, the recognizing that you have to move an application or it's time for it to promote it to its own machine is still v very manual. Um, and I put minutes here not because moving the application usually takes minutes, but because the decision to move it is usually pretty quick. Uh, but it's still a very manual, difficult process. So there's, here's like four categories I brought up. And, and like I said at the beginning, I think there's more. Um, but here's like a set of things that are now sort of in the same time scale of slowness uh, that just acquiring infrastructure used to be at. Um, and this probably just didn't matter uh, before. And when I say before, I don't mean like before today, like before a few years ago. Uh, this probably didn't matter because if acquiring, again, if acquiring a machine took weeks or even you know, hours, then these things taking this long just isn't that big of a deal. But now when you go to a, a uh, when you go to spin up an app and these are the slow parts, it starts to become painful and, and you start to look for a solution for it. And so each of these things are things we've seen solutions pop out of. Um, and obviously the next slide's gonna be bent towards our solutions, but there's more than that. So as an example, like full DC creation SaaS management is like what Terraform was built to do, why we built it two years ago. Um, app deployment and all the uh, app migration stuff are things like Kubernetes and Mesos and Nomad and those sorts of things. Um, and then Oh, I put in front app security without talking about it here, but that's something like Vault. So um, really quickly on like in front app security, it's uh, the, the, the slowness there is we used to be able to have a physical line around our data center. So we used to be able to, well, even further, we used to be able to go to a wall and see a pipe coming in the wall and say that is where the breaches happen. Like if there's going to be a breach, like it's probably right there. And so you would firewall the, the actual like wall, basically. Um, but in, in a cloud world, in a SaaS world, there's no clear perimeter. It's a dotted line, and it's really a weird shape. Um, and so things are moving more towards app-to-app -app security, and defining these sorts of rules is slow. Uh, it's difficult, um, and, it, and it's the new bottleneck. So I don't know how I did that. Um, and one story I like to tell about that is actually a customer that uh, we met at HashiCorp. It was a bank in the UK. Uh, and I, I went with a bunch of people to this bank, and we're, you know, painting this vision of like a beautiful automated future. And their CIO was in the meeting, and he laughed, and he said, like, this is great, this is like really great, but it just doesn't matter if we could deploy in less than a minute, because if we could deploy in less than a minute, our security team still takes six months to update the firewall to allow access to that machine. So like, nothing else matters, and I think that paints the picture right, which is that. You know, these categories of things, this time skill doesn't matter when there's another thing taking months. Like, we painted this picture of this, and that bank didn't care about any of this, even if it takes this long, 
because the firewall thing was taking them six months. So for that, for the info and app security, that's where we started because you have to make that fast first before anything else matters to them. Um, and, and that's sort of where we're heading and why we're seeing these new tools is that uh, we're automating and by building tools, we're leveraging you know, our ability as people to do more with less and, and we're just looking at where we could get that leverage uh, more and more. So Docker, Kubernetes, our tools, this is what they're trying to aim to solve. And, and whereas configuration management, I would argue, is a fairly mainstream thing. It's in the, it's in the heavily adopt or recommended adopt section of like Gartner's Magic Quadrant now. Um, you know, a lot of these things are still not. And it's because we're still heading in that direction. They're still becoming mainstream. Um, it's not a solved problem yet, but we're working on it, right? Uh, and so, and so again, I just remind you that the goal of all this stuff is just to deliver and maintain applications. Uh, that's, you know, it'll, it'll be complex. I think that anything new requires initial complexity before we understand it well enough to simplify it to its core needs. Um, but it'll be complex, but the complexity is there to simplify and make this better. So hopefully we're heading in that direction, uh, and hopefully that helps uh, start some conversations for the talks the rest of today. So. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll talk to you today.